Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture, Mark 5, 1 through 20, is the second of three miracles that Mark attests to Jesus. The first miracle was stilling of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. The third was the hemorrhaging woman and Jairus' daughter. And the second is the Gerasenes demonic. As Jesus disembarks on the other side of the sea, the disciples fade from the story. A ghastly figure takes center stage. He's possessed, he howls, he dashes himself with stones. His strength, his strength is such that no human figure can bind or control him. From his first encounter with Jesus, there's no question who is in control. Jesus is the strong one with the upper hand and the demonic cowers and asks that he be left alone. When it becomes apparent that Jesus will expel the demons, their name is Legion, for there are many of them. They ask instead to be sent into a nearby herd of swine. Jesus permits this, and the herd of pigs rushes headlong into the lake and drowns. Did you know that pigs can swim? The point for Mark, obviously, is not to have told a story that represents accurately a community and its pigs. In this story about the kingdom of God, it becomes increasingly clear that humanity its society and institutions impedes the inbreaking of God's kingdom more than it expedites. The way the kingdom of God breaks into the world in Mark's story wrests control from humanity. Their way of dealing with the demonic, ostracism and segregation is not tenable in God's kingdom. God's kingdom in Mark's gospel comes with power, power to do things that humans cannot do on their own. It transforms and forces humans to perceive the truth that God's kingdom best takes root in the marginalized, the outcast, those seemingly most insignificant. This runs counter to the human institutions in which power, wealth, fame, and influence are given pride of place. God works through flawed people and institutions. The kingdom of God breaks into the world not so much through flawed institutions and individuals, but in spite of them. Individuals and society structures set impediments to the kingdom, which it ignores. The kingdom value those who are flawed, not as a way of making best of what we've got or making lemonade out of lemons, but because that seems to be the essence of its disposition. The kingdom of God is oriented toward those whom society deems flawed and keeps at arm's length. When the thing we fear most is transformed and brought directly into our midst, our natural inclina inclination is fear and a reliance upon violence to rid, us, rid ourselves of the change we cannot explain. Mark 5, 1 through 20. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. Jer and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. A man lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus, Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before Jesus. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged Jesus earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine and the herd numbering about 2000 rushed deep down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned by the, in the sea. The swine herders ran off and told it in the city and the country then the people came to see what it was, was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demonic sitting there, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. 
Those who had seen what had happened to the demonic and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy has, he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim to the Depocalus how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. So there is a joke among pastors and theologians that it is impossible to preach on the Trinity without invoking multiple heresies. So it is quite fortunate on this Trinity Sunday that I find myself in the clear for a couple of reasons. For one, this is a UCC and DOC church, and those are what's called non-credal denominations. So such heresies need not apply. I'm not familiar enough with the history to say what might be called heretical, if anything, but that's clearly a sermon for another time. And two, I'm not going to attempt to explain in any rational terms what the Trinity is. Rather, I'm preaching on otherness and deviance, especially when it comes to the people whom we call wrong and what God has to do with it. Specifically how the Trinity sets a foundation for seeing the image of God in the other and almost more importantly, seeing deviance as part of God's holy being. Uh, apropos to this topic, as Jeff mentioned earlier, you'll notice that I'm deviating from my usual Sunday worship location of at my desk and praying, hoping against hope that the background is at least mostly presentable. Um, and for that, I do thank my ongoing computer problems. I do not have disassociative identity disorder. Uh, the condition previously known as multiple personalities and which people who experience it nowadays tend to call multiplicity and thus cannot understand the experience of multiplicity as such. The many facets of myself are not distinct and I will not pretend that they are. So why bring it up at all? Quite simply, it's relevant because contemporary biblical scholars tend to equate accounts of demonic possession with forms of mental illness, uh, for better and for worse. In the case of the Gerizim demoniac and his legion of afflicting spirits, that equation is to dissociative identity disorder most often. And there is a lot worth saying about that comparison. Uh, and I hope there is someone to proclaim it to this congregation someday. Um, Nevertheless, I have grown to relate to the Jerzyn demoniac, uh, neither for his possession nor for the condition attributed to him, but for his isolation and otherness. Over the past, um, doing some quick mental math, uh, not eight months, nine months, I'm not a math major, so. Let's, uh, let's just call it what it is. Um, I've shared many stories from this uh, digital pulpit about the, uh, that, or about the vulnerabilities of myself uh, for which I have often been othered. Um, the, status of my, the status of my gender identity, my experience with, um, with neuroatypicality and mental health challenges, um, even just the raw, the raw truth of what being Armenian uh, in the diaspora means. And I'd like to complete just a little more of this puzzle on my last Sunday by talking a bit about my experience of crisis of faith and struggles with the church. You see, I relate to this man who goes unnamed in the Gospels because 
I grew up with church as a foundational community. My dad's a pastor. My grandpa's a pastor. One of my aunties is a pastor. And I found out quite recently that one of my great grandpas was a pastor. So there's a whole lot of church in the wider Gekezian, Shahinian, et cetera, family. Um, and there was a real sense of home and friendship to it uh, until slowly but surely there wasn't. Um, I think most folks in this Zoom meeting will remember the 2008 general election. And uh, frankly, even if you didn't live in California, I think it was big enough news that you probably remember uh, the uh, CA Proposition 8 on the 2008 ballot, um, a bill set to formally crim uh, criminalize uh, same gender marriages, um, especially on on grounds having to do with teaching and, of course, the fear of, quote, exposing children to uh, behavior that, of course, can't be something germane to the experience of growing up. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of that homophobia, a lot of the campaigning around passing this um, deeply homophobic state bill or state, was was fueled by uh, organized Christianity. Um, uh, of course, we know not all Christians, I speak here today in a Christian church as an openly queer and trans person, and yet, um, and yet the experience of even saying in that time of my unfolding identity formation that I didn't think this was okay, that the that the ballot measure was hateful and that and that um especially from the understanding i had about god then that uh to be gay was just part of part of a way someone is made um and though and though my understanding of myself and sexuality is transformed nonetheless my steadfastness in this belief that people should be treated, people should be treated uh, well, regardless of their cont of their of what they can't help about themselves, remains. And indeed, now that that is part of God's image, for the next seven years, I um, was on a lot of planes of being in a protracted argument with the divine. Um, I had a very unfortunate, uh, extremely online atheist phase. Uh, there were times when I just turned to seeing the spiritual in nature and that can be it. Uh, it's a complicated story and one that is um, more familiar than I imagined as a lonely teenager who felt an absence of meaningful connection. Um, including the absence of comfort in the church communities that had formed me. And so when I read this passage about a man afflicted by forces outside of his control that are part of the reality he knows, I get it. Though I have not literally been out in the tombs, I have felt like there are vanishingly few people in the world I could connect to, though I have not had the strength to break the chains that bound me. I have still felt bound metaphorically and have felt tempted to do harm to myself because of, because of facts about my being that I could not reconcile with what I was hearing from forces that claim to speak for God. But why are some people dismissed as wrong by their community or by the wider culture? Well, for one, not all wrongness is created equal. Um, what an individual might find unwelcome is very, conte very contextual uh, to bring out the old Pacific School of Religion vocabulary, it is very socially located. Um, 
there's understandable reasons why someone like me just does not want to associate with uh, with people who are very proud, um, very proud political and social conservatives, not because I don't have the capacity to love them and that their otherness is beyond care or that I feel they're undeserving. That's untrue, but because because there's an amount of harm's way I feel I don't need to constantly subject myself to. And thus, I feel that everyone has, has a sense of this is wrong for me to interact with. This type of value system and the people who express it will be other. And that's understandable. Um, this is a type of other that though, that though considered deviant to you, is often quite socially familiar and socially acceptable. That's a different dynamic from when people on the margins, well, actually the margins really speak for that because the margins are the place where people are sent to be unnoticed um, because of a deviance of behavior, a wrongness of being that keeps them from being at this from being wanted at the center by wider society. And this is harmful. We see in the we see in the story how the enforced narrow normalcy of the society that the demoniac hails from of the city of Grasa, according to Mark, that he that this is a person who has been greatly harmed by what the people of the community he has been a part of considers normal and right. He experiences deep isolation. The only companions he has are whatever spirit of the dead he might feel living in the tombs. He experiences a deep lack of care, not only from this extreme forms of self-harm he engages in, but also just from the care of real human connection. And it raises another question for me. Who is in and who's out anyway? The Gerizim demoniac is a social out because the presence of him and with his afflictions are considered draining, I imagine, that the behavior that is presented in the Gospels is outside of his control and erratic and the type of discomfort he expresses through, through, through physical violence and through shrieking and a general personal unrest is something that deeply stresses out a society that won't accept it for what it is and not just accommodate, but allow for that type of existence to be part of community be a part of wider being, but actively reject, but actively rejects it. And so we see kind of an obvious conclusion here, regardless of how we read the text and regardless of what this unnamed demoniac may have thought of his condition, he departs Jesus elated and proclaiming witness to the miraculous work that he experienced, because this was the thing that allowed him to have care and connection again. And so what does the Trinity have to do with this? All right, this is going to sound like a stretch and you may depart this worship service believing, you know what, she spoke well, uh, some parts of her delivery were funny. Um, I'll miss her as part of this church but I just don't think she quite hit the nail on the head. And you know what? That's allowed. Sometimes I depart a space think thinking that, uh, but we don't have time to unpack that. However, I'm just going to say that the mystery of the Trinity, just out of hand, is important to how I understand God's nature. And God's nature is deeply present in this passage. Uh, for one, in Jesus' willingness to see a human being, a creature of God, uh, someone bearing the image of the creator whom Jesus calls father in a person who is profoundly socially outcast. But also, I 
think there's a less obvious way. The Gerizim demoniac is an individual who, because of the affliction of this legion of foul spirits, is multiplicitous in his identity and personal formation. And you know what else is the Trinity? After all, the Trinity, as Christians describe God's being, is one is one divine that can be understood as three persons and the two are not separate. There's many wonderful primary source accounts from Christian history of learned, learned people of the Christian faith trying very hard to, to mathematically explain how this makes sense. Uh, and that always fails because the Trinity is something of mystery and of ecstatic truth. It is a thing of paradox and wrongness on the surface that is other and familiar all at once. So we believe in a God whose characteristics make them both intimate and alien. And I think that is beautiful. And I believe that this informs us about how to treat others, how to give care to those who, who are dubbed not worthy of care. The paradoxical mathematics of the Trinity can often make for some confusing theology. And I will insist that that's good because people are complicated and God is complicated and we do a lot of harm by trying to simplify that experience. And I'm sure there's a list of things, of aspects of the human experience y'all can produce about how the church has done harm in its enforcement of right being. Um, one that comes to mind, and of course, addition to gender and sexual orientation of race and ethnicity and of social class is sex. Yes, a three letter, a three letter word, a, a trinity of letters that might send chill down the spines of the congregant, if only because the party line of Christianity for a long time has been sex is the thing you do to make babies and you don't talk about. And if it is and if it happens outside of that context, well, that's deviance and deviance is not part of God's image. And yet. And yet. We, have, we believe in a God whose singular being is expressed as an intimate connection between three persons. Uh, make, of that, make of that what you will. I see John Smith laughing. Um, and, I, and I am too. Uh, no puns were intended, but I'll take it. Um, and it actually recalls to me my favorite image of the Trinity which is described by the Greeks with the word perichoresis. The traditional image is of three men, because, you know, of course, you know, medieval Orthodox art, they, God in all aspects are men, um, not always, but in many cases. Uh, and yet in discussion together, they are connected through crossing and intertwining their legs at the knee. Um, and in modern imagination, this is made more lively and more wonderfully intimate um, by depicting the Trinity as a lively dance, one dance of three persons that cannot be separated, thus is their connection. And so this is the part of the sermon where I ask, let's read against the text. We know that in the literal words, the gospel of Mark, and I believe in Luke and Matthew as well, that the Gerizim demoniac or the Gadarene as he is in Matthew, um, because the location is unclear, suffers, and the text claims that he is suffering because of his condition. And that's valid. Conditions that people are othered for can cause suffering, maybe not just because of themselves, but definitely because of how they're treated. But we should imagine that a Gerizim demoniac who suffers not because of legion, but because of a society that tells him, no, 
you are undivine, you are unwanted, and and the way you treat yourself is not worth our time caring and thus integrating into society. And this is where my call to you is. Embrace divine mystery by embracing human variety and vice versa. Why do we accept something as strange and mathematically paradoxical as the Trinity if we do not then apply that to other people, to our openness to other people? Everyone, everyone has their set of others. I do. There are some people for whom I'm ashamed that my default location is other because of aspects of the way I was raised, not necessarily by my parents, but definitely by the society around me. And yet I feel the necessary and continual challenge of saying, it doesn't matter the reasons I feel disconnected to you, you bear the image of God. And that means you're worth caring for. You're worth having connection to. And it might not come from me, but it needs to come from someone. And this matters to me, at least, because I am other by many metrics. And the thing is, though I can only speak for myself, I've had the privilege of getting to know fairly deeply a variety of people from different contexts. And what I can say pretty confidently is that there is more deviance and nonconformity among human beings, among those we call us, and not simply the them we're willing to cast aside, than we usually give it credit for. And that other, and that, and that behavior is not other. It is a holy thing and worthy of being and, and worthy of having God's image recognized in it. Amen.